Hey guys, you know, um, going back to some more questions I get pretty regularly and, you know, issues and discussions that keep coming up and specifically manual hubs. For some reason, manual hubs still just keep popping up. Uh, a lot of people seem to think that a manual hub will make less things rotate in their drivetrain. And that's actually not the case. And I know that seems kind of weird, but on Chevy's, we don't actually have a transfer case that disconnects the front drive shaft. As you can see here, Okay, so the Tahoe overlanding axle swapped Tahoe. Let's see. Let's see, that one. You can hear it, look. It's in two-wheel drive, but listen. And not only is it engaged, but I can hear it. Up here in the transfer case, other evidence is I'm spinning the front drive shaft, but watch the rear shaft. See it? As I spin the front shaft, it's spinning the rear shaft because it's engaged. And here. Okay, so let's try the 2001 Silverado. I don't feel like putting this up on the lift just to check this, so I'm gonna climb up under it. Okay, so I'm up underneath 2001 Chevy Silverado. Like I said, I didn't want to put it up on the lift just to check the uh, drive shaft. So I'm up underneath it right now, laying in the, in, on the ground in the cold snow. See the drive shaft. Listen, hear it? And what you're hearing is back at the transfer case end. I can hear the clunking, it's engaged. So the drive shaft is actually spinning from the transfer case end, and that's why Chevy put the center axle disconnect on their differentials with that actuator that threads into the inter, uh, independent front suspension differential. Uh, so even if you had manual hubs, it's not doing you any good. Uh, not on these trucks. And on some trucks, sure, that have a fully disconnecting transfer case, you might have a, a little bit less rotating the mass, sure. But on our trucks, there's no reason to even worry about manual hubs. And as I showed in this video here, that um, manual hub um, axles, even the Dana 60 manual hub axles have smaller bearings at the hub than we have in our unit bearing assemblies. So why go for the weaker uh, component uh, when you have you know, a better option and you can use the hub assemblies you already have on your truck? So it's cheaper, you get to keep ABS because that's got the ABS sensors built into it also. And it's stronger. And also, it doesn't have any additional rotating mass uh, over a manual hub axle. So I have gotten questions. Um, if you haven't watched all my videos, you'll see that, uh, you know, for the Dodge center axle disconnect is what they call it, the CAD. So if you're here, we call it CAD. I'm talking about the center axle disconnect. Uh, we use the 4x4 posi lock cable. This is a cable assembly out of uh, one of those. And... It's a kit you buy, uh, ready to go. We buy it for the Dodge, and it has a little housing that goes onto the axle here. You see it uses the shift fork from the factory Dodge um, CAD housing. And this cable here threads into the side of it. And that cable goes up through um, a hole in the firewall and mounts under the dash, and you just you know, basically actuate, oh, I can't really actuate it too much because there's a zip tie on it, uh, but you basically actuate your four-wheel drive here. And inside that housing on the differential side is a collar. And so you have a two-piece axle shaft and two, um, and a collar that slides between the two. So when it has a shift fork that slides it over, it engages both axles together. That is how Dodge does it. It's actually a pretty beefy way to do it compared to what Chevy did in the independent suspension differentials, which was the same concept, but not nearly as strong. So that's how we do that. We use this, this cable kit. The Dodge used vacuum and diaphragms and it was garbage. It was very problematic, not even worth looking at. Now, just to be, you know, um, you know, thorough, I want, want you to know that I actually spent a lot of time looking into having a housing of my own machined to accept the Chevy differential actuator to actuate it so we could plug in our Chevy differential actuators and have it 
you know, actuate the Dodge CAD. But the problem is the Chevy differential actuator just didn't have enough throw. It's from its fully retracted to its fully extended position did not throw enough to actuate the Dodge CAD. So I, you know, eventually abandoned that. I looked at um, ideas of, um, you know, having some kind of cantilever or a cam that, that increased the throw. I was like, you know, it's just too problematic anyway. Not that those actuators are even known for being very reliable. So I abandoned that quickly. Uh, but other options for, um, for you are a one-piece axle on the uh, passenger side. I actually have one here. This is a used one that I have here. It uh, needs a new U-joint where I've got it out. And you'll see from the end of the splines to the center of the U-joint is 37 and 3 sixteenths. Now I can already see you guys thinking, oh, you know what, that looks just like a regular Dana 44 axle shaft. I'll just get a long side axle shaft from like an old Chevy. Except if you look at the lengths of the old Chevys and even the old Fords, this is longer by at least half an inch than any old Chevy or Ford ever was. So I can save you the trouble of trying to hunt around and find one. Now you can actually purchase this, uh, and it's chrome only, um, and you can purchase this from here. And you can see it comes with a little block off plate for your uh, um, CAD housing and, you know, everything. So it's not even that expensive if you ever wanted to do that instead and just bypass it. Uh, it is nice, though, to have the center axle disconnect so that if you are driving, you don't, you're not actually really in true four-wheel drive. With that center axle disconnect, your front end's not going to fight you, especially on pavement or in, in parking lots and stuff. So for those that are doing a two-wheel drive conversion uh, and are swapping in an NP2 41 C transfer case You could consider this because that one does fully disengage the front drive shaft when in two-wheel drive So you could get the one-piece axle shaft uh, Because if you don't I mean you're gonna need something like this and this kit uh, Is a good portion of the cost of the one-piece axle shaft so for you it may be worth it But for others it's not worth doing because it's you need to have some way of disconnecting it from the transfer case and actually having two-wheel drive now, I've heard various reports that there are a year range where the electric shift transfer cases in Chevys don't hang up in two-wheel drive. I've heard it be the GMT 900 platform. I think GMT 900, it doesn't. I've heard something like 05, 04. Um, so that's not even technically a GMT 900 um, platform. That would just be kind of when they went to the cat eye. But I haven't been able to substantiate it. Uh, so if anybody really knows for sure if and when the uh, transfer cases are built differently to where they will, you know, let go of that front drive shaft when a two-wheel drive, I would love to know it. Um, so I hope that uh, we can get some additional knowledge and start spreading it around. So if anybody's watching this and has that knowledge, please comment. So, uh, but until, you know... Um, we know more about that. I'm just going to say that I know for a fact that most GMT 800s that I've ever had, all GMT 800s that I've had, um, the front drive shaft locks in. So you have to have some way of disconnecting the axle from the transfer case. And manual hubs is one way of doing it, but really it's a more expensive and more ancient archaic way and causes you to lose ABS and it gains you no benefits because, as I've mentioned, on this swap, they don't cause for any less rotating mass because the drive shaft is spinning either way. So if you were thinking about uh, doing the swap, but were really leaning on uh, doing manual hubs, I can just tell you right now, it's not even worth it. Uh, it's not going to gain you a single thing, and it will cost you weaker bearings and a lack of ABS. So if you're trying to do a solid axle swap, and what most people, what I'm talking about is going and getting a Ford high pinion axle, because basically most Dana 44s out of Fords were high pinion. Not all of them, but most of them were. There's people that go and get the Ford high pinion Dana 44. But then they get the Chevy outers and put them uh, in, uh, put them on the Ford axle, the uh, Ford Dana 44, and that makes it six on five and a half. 
So let's talk about some of the other reasons why you don't want to do a manual hub swap. Uh, because, first of all, we've already covered that they don't um, actually disconnect any more uh, parts from your drivetrain. So that's out the window. Uh, you don't have ABS. We've already covered that. <clears throat> but also, the wheel studs. The old outers use a tiny little 7 16 by 20 thread stud, and it's short. It's like an inch long. And that's because back then, every vehicle had steel wheels. And <clears throat> so they had short little studs. Well, you know that Chevy's use an M14 by 1.50 in our generation, or basically anything from 1990 newer uses an M14 by 1.5 thread pitch, which is essentially a 9 16 stud. So comparing 7 16 to 9 16 that's an eighth inch bigger in diameter. That's a huge difference. Okay, so this Chevy truck is actually a two-wheel drive, but it's from the same era, and it has the same uh, wheel stud length. You can see with the advent of uh, mag wheels that um, the studs were just too dang short, so you had to use like a mag-style lug nut. You see this sort of sleeve end, and that see how that fits tight in that hole, and so that threaded down in and got thread purchase, and then there was usually a washer right here. And that's actually what um, tightened the wheel to the uh, hub. So, uh, as you can see, these were all lug-centric and not hub-centric as well. So this is what your centering was done, and that's how they got that extra thread purchase, was slipping it down through the wheel. And these mag wheels that are on this old 60s, 70s trucks, um, see how thick that is? You can actually see the thickness of the wheel. It's thicker than most aluminum wheels are. So you do usually get, you know, enough thread purchase to at least thread um, the lug nut on, but it's usually not much. Even if that was, you know, an extra three-eighths of an inch, you're still only getting less than a quarter inch of thread purchase with an aluminum wheel on those studs. So uh, it's not ideal. I've got this old six-lug manual hub axle out here in storage. It literally has been in the scrap pile for, uh, well, I think it's been... 10 years. So uh, I thought it would be a good example to show um, show the uh, wheel studs and how small they are and how tiny these wheel studs are. In comparison, look at how much wheel stud on a GMT 900 stud is left versus that one. But also, look how much bigger it is. You can actually see it behind it. This is a 14 millimeter wheel stud, which is essentially 9 sixteenths. This is a 7 16 inch wheel stud. So it's short and thin. But what you have to do is, you see they're knurled here. You have to drill the stud, you have not the stud, the, drill the spindle out to have the larger knurling so that it is still a tight press fit. And it captures the brake rudder to the back of the spindle. That's how those old hubs work. So you have to have... I just drilled it. I have this drilled it because I've actually done this. Right here. 39 64ths. Now that's assuming you've got a drill press or a, or a mill and you can center it and not have your holes be out of whack at all because those are also lug centric hubs as well. But this, this drill bit's actually hard to find. It's not stocked in anywhere because it's bigger than half an inch. And you'll be surprised trying to find a drill bit in 64 increments over the size of half an inch, you're not going to find anybody that stocks that. You got a special order that drill bit. So you got to drill out the, the spindle to a larger size to press in longer and larger diameter wheel studs. So, I mean, <clears throat> oh, I left out that obviously you can't run factory compatible wheels because of the smaller uh, center bore on the wheels on the newer trucks. You can't run those wheels all over that giant hub in the middle of the old style outers either. Plus, I mean, it's just ancient technology. And for someone who's trying to avoid wear and tear and the fewer rotating parts, manual hub axles have all these little pieces inside of them to fail and wear out and to snap and break. If anybody's been off-roading much at all, especially with either a manual hub axle or with anybody that has a manual hub axle, 
the hub components and mechanisms fail and break all the time. That's the weak part of those axles are the hub components. So if anyone's really considering doing a swap but hesitating to do the top overlanding axle swap because they want to have manual hubs, please reconsider and realize that you gain nothing by doing a manual hub swap. Nothing at all. And hopefully, hopefully this has been helpful to teach you guys something new about uh, solid axle conversions that you didn't know. Thanks for watching.